From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is not here right now, but will be returning shortly. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. It's no secret these days, Matt, that uh, while we've been recording, you can hear sounds in the background. You can probably hear them in this episode as well. Uh, Those are signs of human activity, and human activity plays a big role in this week's special two-part episode uh, we're going to we're going to lean on our dear dear friends our Australian conspiracy realist for these especially in our first episode and let's start it this way Matt you and I are we love dogs right like you've got a dog yes. with you as a co-producer basically I do Meadow is always here always panting ready for action <laughs> and and notes. I and notes, and notes, uh, and has uh, literally great taste in vinyl. So, so <laughs> still mad about that one, I imagine. So, why do we want your help in particular, dear Australian friends? Well, today's episode, the first part of this two part episode, takes us to Oceania. This is the region of the world that is home to a tremendous diversity, not just biodiversity of animals, but diversity of cultures. It has an ancient past and no ding on the rest of the world. It's pretty unique. This region is home to vast numbers of organisms that simply do not naturally exist anywhere else on the planet. It's similar in a, in a bigger way to pandas in the mainland of China. Like you see a panda outside of China, you're in a zoo or you're hanging out with a very wealthy, very shady individual. Uh, this, it's so nuts. We, we've talked about this before, but in the ancient, ancient, ancient past, this area of the world encountered long periods of isolation, uh, lo- so long that the average human mind could not comprehend them And because of this isolation, there was opportunity for the animals that lived there already to evolve and to assume various roles, various ecological niches that were usually filled with placental mammals. We're talking marsupials. So you might pause at this moment and say, well, what are placental mammals? Short answer, pretty much every mammal except for marsupials and monotremes. If you live in the U.S., the marsupial that you are most familiar with in the wild is the infamous possum. Feel bad for them. I love animals. Not my favorite animals, but they're they're there. They have a right to exist. Uh, But in the region of the world we're talking about, marsupials for a long time ran the game. They took on the role of... The scavengers, they took on the role of the, like, the prey animals, you know. They even took on the role of the predators. We cannot wait to hear your thoughts on this one. Since about 1930, various people from around the planet have traveled to this specific region of the world, and specifically one island we'll get to in a second, to search for one mysterious marsupial in particular, the legendary officially extinct thylacine fancy name thylacinus cynocephalus street name the tasmanian tiger even though it's extinct people are searching for it why here are the facts yes uh if you took a look at a thylacine just kind of strolling on by today if one were to exist to be able to do that you'd be like oh man that was a weird dog that was a really (laughs) weird dog it's like a tiger in the back a little stray dog in the front. It's kind of a yellowish brown color, kind of maybe gray, uh, depending on which one you saw. And uh, I don't. Know, it's got the nose almost of a greyhound or or one of those uh, longer snouted hounds. 
Like that a Borzoi, seen... maybe? Yeah. Oh, that's a good one. Wow. Uh, yeah. Uh, it reminds me of that, but it, it slinks a little differently. <laughs> it does. It's known for, it was known for its uh, kind of stiff, somewhat lazy movements. And we'll, we'll discover why we know so much about how this extinct creature moved in just a bit. Uh, it's carnivorous. It's marsupial. It's native, or it was native, to Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea in particular. And like other marsupials in this isolated ecosystem, it evolved to fill a niche that was typically held by the other mammals. Again, all mammals that we know of, except for monotremes, it's like echidna and platypus, uh, or marsupials, all of them are placental mammals. The thylacine most likely appeared around 2 million years ago, and we know that humans in the area knew about them for a long time. We know this because of art. We know that you can find depictions of thylacine-like creatures in engravings and paintings and whatnot dating back thousands of years. And various aboriginal groups, the people who were living there for, again, thousands and thousands of years before outsiders arrived, they knew the animal well. They didn't call it the tiger, though. Uh, depending on the community, they would call it the corina, the canuna, the cananer, the lagunta, and so on, depending on the people you were talking to at the time. So where did we get the name Tasmanian tiger? Oh, yes. Well, I mean, some Europeans showed up. And they heard those other names, maybe being spoken by by the Aboriginal people, by the people who lived there originally, and just thought, ah, uh, we're not going to go with that. And it doesn't really roll off the tongue the way we want it to. We're going to call this thing here the Tasmanian tiger. Yeah, because you saw those stripes, right? On the spine going down the back, those kind of black stripes that go across. It looks like a tiger to me. Hence, we now dub the, the Tasmanian tiger. Uh, or sometimes the Tasmanian wolf as well. Again, it does look kind of like a dog to me more so than a large cat, like a tiger. Dog in the front, tiger in the back. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> calling it a wolf was pretty reasonable. I agree with you. Because if you look at the side-by-side -side comparison of a thylacine skull and the skull of a wolf, like let's take a gray wolf, for example, you're going to have a hard time telling the difference, honestly. Other uh, than e e si like sheer size. Other than sheer size, you're going to have a tough time telling the difference because they are extraordinarily similar due to a beautiful, creepy phenomenon called convergent evolution. That is when different species who may have started out from very different origin points evolve similar traits because they find themselves occupying the same ecological niche. Uh, and there's there's great speculative fiction about this. There's great uh, scientific, you could call them thought experiments about how Earth could have worked out with different dominant species or different sorts of life forms occupying any number of roles, including the apex predator world ending position of human. So, you know, if you want to go multiverse with it, this is a, this is a fun thing to think about. And I don't mean that sarcastically. There are Quite possibly other universes just to the left of ours where whatever occupies the role of humans is doing whatever their version of a podcast is today. Oh, neat. I know, neat. not useful for our conversation, <laughs> but neat. Well, neat. Let, let's break that down just a little bit further, the, con, the convergent evolution thing. Just the concept that an environment needs a bunch of different types of animals in order for it to kind of be in harmony. Honestly, really. So if you imagine, let's say... Uh, in Tasmania, there are a large number, a huge population, maybe an, uh, a growing almost out of proportion population of small rodents or small mammals, you know, or just tiny little creatures like that, that are maybe eating plants. And they're just going through a lot of the plant life that exists there. And the, the system needs a predator like the thylacine that does eat meat to go out and take care of that population or at least uh, dwindle it down quite a bit just for lunch, you know? <laughs> right, right, exactly, nailed it. And lest that sound too brutal, folks, consider the alternative. Uh, one thing a lot of 
prey species have in common is that they reproduce at a higher rate than predators. And I mean, that's how things are supposed to work. And when they do that, if their population is not culled by predation at some threshold, it will be culled by something, whether that is mass starvation after resources are exhausted or whether that is the propagation of a new disease, you know? So, yep. yeah. So something is, something's going to give one way or another. Uh, the thylacine were, for all intents and purposes, a canine of, of this area. And they were descended from much larger creatures, which are super cool. Uh, they uh, honestly, yeah, the only non dog part of their appearance, in my opinion, is that stiff tail those odd stripes. But if you look closely, they have a different number of digits on their hind legs. They're, they're very, they're very much not dogs, which we have to emphasize because that plays a role in what we're talking about today. They've got like kind of cute, so adorable doggy faces as well. They weren't as dangerous as, you know, actual Siberian tigers or something, but they were very much apex predators. We don't know exactly how big their prey was, uh, given that they lived in packs and often hunted in pairs, it is possible that they could target larger prey, creatures that an uh, individual tiger could not have taken down alone. We do know they probably ate a lot of birds, which I feel like our pal Noel would consider a selling point. Yeah, he definitely would. There are a lot of beautiful birds, though, out there in Australia and, and Tasmania and the places we're talking about today. There wouldn't be if the tigers had anything to do with it. That's mm. true. So the uh, uh, fun fact before we move on, I just want to shout out the Australian Museum for being able to explain the scientific name of the tiger with a straight face, Thylacinus sinocephalus, which you mentioned earlier, translates to dog-headed pouch dog. Nice. That's they just put the dog in there twice. Well, <laughs> so, but it makes sense. You know, we 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 kind of we mentioned placental animals versus the marsupial, marsupials, right? I think most of us understand the difference between those two. You know, uh, uh, an animal that is inside the womb and has the placental uh, wrapping, basically, that provides nutrients for the baby mammal, and then when it's birthed, it's still got uh, part of that attached. Uh, in the case of these marsupials, there's that pouch that you always think about, maybe that you learned about kangaroos when you were younger or something, where the the tiny, itty-bitty, little, newly birthed baby goes inside that pouch where it can get the nutrients it needs from the parent. Yeah, and when we say pouch, remember, we're talking biology. Uh, pouch is, is the common <laughs> description, but really, just think of a snot pocket. That's what it is. Oh. It's a snot pocket. Oh, man. You're welcome, everyone. Sorry. Uh, but yes, so we're describing these things. Next question. Cool. Neat. Where are they now? Well, although the British are definitely the bad guys in the story of Europe's encroachment into Australia, the tiger was already extinct on the Australian mainland well before the British arrived. In fact, by the time they hit town, the Tasmanian tiger population was believed to live largely on the island of Tasmania. It was their last stronghold, you could say, against the humans. They were casualties of the long war. Humanity is waged against the natural world. And this means it's a war waged by all humans. Even now, even you know, if you don't think of yourself as a combatant in that war, in some ways you're contributing to it by existing basically. Uh, by about 40,000 years ago, Australia had already lost 90% of its megafauna, the, the big animals, to humans. There were other factors that you know, were probably involved, environmental factors and so on, but it was a tremendous human-led culling. Very few big critters survived. Exceptions would be things like the Tasmanian tiger or the kangaroo. The arrival of the dingo, in particular, increased competition for survival amid the thylacines on the mainland. Again, way, 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 way before the British. And that makes sense because the dingo occupies a similar ecological role. They become competitors. Uh, this problem is compounded when Europeans arrive and they bring their dogs with them. 
Wild dogs are now another fighter on the field. Uh, the humans in Tasmania considered the tiger a pest. They blamed it for attacks on lucrative livestock, on sheep. Attacks that, it turns out, were probably exaggerated and propagandized. So humans started hunting them. The local governments and regimes put forth various bounty systems, similar to the cobra effect, which I mentioned a couple times recently. And as a result, the tiger population dwindled rapidly. Their natural environment began to degrade due to human intervention. Uh, their the ecological stress was driving them away from their normally nocturnal hunting patterns. And too late, humanity realized the tiger was on the way out. Zoos around the world started calling for captive specimens, not so much to display them, but in the zoo's defense, they were hoping to get breeding pairs and they were honestly trying to save the species. All of these attempts, every single one, they were all unsuccessful. And so it came to pass that the last thylacine outside of Australia died in captivity at the London Zoo in 1931. Not the last thylacine ever, but the last one outside of Australia. Yes, and so that's outside of Australia or Oceania in that area. Uh, but then inside, there was a guy named, guess what? Guess what the, the guy's name was? It was Benjamin. There's a, there's a Tasmanian tiger named Benjamin. He was living at the Hobart Zoo. And unfortunately, it died a few years later in 1936. That's on September 6th. And, you know, it's thought that perhaps neglect was at play there. Maybe. Maybe not, but you can see footage of this guy. If you go online, search for David Flay, I think, or Flea, F-L-E-A-Y, and uh, he was a naturalist, and he was he took some photographs of Benjamin in 1933, and you he can actually, it's really too. cool. He mm-hmm. filmed the mm-hmm. clip, you can see the video. That's how, that's, there's our reveal, our first reveal. That's how we know how the Tasmanian tigers moved or how we have a yes. sense of it. Because unlike many other extinct animals, we can see the little guy, little Benjamin walking around. Do we actually get to see Ben bite David on the bottom? <laughs> no, but that did happen. He got bit on the keister while he's filming. Look, we said these creatures deserve to exist. We never said they were nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you know. Any any creature that is a predator, if you're in their environment, I mean, come on, you're going to get bit. Yeah, I think that is a super good point because there are still predators. Today, the Tasmanian tiger is considered officially extinct. However, ever since Benjamin passed away back then, people throughout the region, especially in southern Victoria, have claimed that they've seen living Tasmanian tigers in the wild. So today's question, what's going on? Could those stories be true? We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors and we'll dive in. Here's where it gets crazy. You know, Matt, if you think about it, it's not really surprising that cryptozoologists, uh, just like our friend Todd over at the local, would be so fascinated by the case of the thylacine. I mean, it checks a lot of boxes for an animal that humans could miss. Yeah, and for me, it's primarily because if this thing did exist and you just caught a glimpse of it, maybe in the bush or in the, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, you just saw one kind of run past or dive into some bushes, uh, you may think it was just a dog. You may think it was, you know, a, a maybe a, a dingo. Dingoes are still around, right? Yeah, dingoes, dingoes are still very much in play. It could very likely be something else, which means for humans who are interested in perhaps catching, you know, a glimpse of one of these fabled creatures out there, uh, there's going to be a lot of confirmation bias occurring in probably grainy film that's been taken, you know, since the 1930s. Uh, <laughs> uh, certainly now. You can go online and see many a video of people who supposedly caught a glimpse of a thylacine, you know, in the 90s and the 2000s. But it's very difficult to confirm with the evidence 
that's been captured. Yeah, exactly. And the the thing that's weird is that the people who are reporting these sightings, and there have been a great many sightings or alleged sightings since 1930, those folks aren't all just tourists. We are going to mention a tourist later in today's show, but uh, several of them are park rangers, experts, the, the number one people who would be most likely to not misidentify a tiger, right, or a dingo. Uh, they often didn't report these things because they felt like it would make them seem kind of woo-woo or unreliable, etc. cetera. Uh, but these reports have been coming in more often than you think. And they even continue today. And there are a couple of reasons why. And you, not all of which necessitate the existence of the tiger. Spoiler alert. Let's consider the case of a German guy, a tourist named Claus Emmerichs, who traveled to the area in 2005 in February. He said he had digital photographs of a thylacine he saw near the Lake St. Clair National Park. Experts looked at this. They couldn't confirm the identity of the creature, mainly because the, the pictures only showed the animals. But, uh, but this incident, combined with these two very detailed sightings from 1983 in a remote area called the Cape York Peninsula, inspired a group of scientists to set up a bunch of camera traps to hopefully catch the animal in 2017. And for anybody who's wondering what a camera trap is, uh, you've seen this footage in so many nature documentaries. It's clever. It Don't be fooled by the word trap. It doesn't hurt the animal. Uh, there's a like kind of a, a mechanism set up so that if an animal is walking in the woods and they trip whatever this thing is, then a it, it tells the camera that there's something to be photographed and then the camera takes a photo. Does it scare the animal? Sure. It probably scares the stripes off of them, but it doesn't hurt them. So it's a great way for humans to observe the natural world with a minimum amount of invasiveness. Yes. And a lot of those newer camera traps just have highly sensitive motion detection devices in there or systems, sensors, so that it can just sit there for a long period of time and only function in the moments when there's motion then when you're finished with, I don't even know, I guess a week, a couple of days of it being out there, you just take a card out of it and you've got just a huge folder full of pictures, most of which have nothing in it. But in this case, there were some pictures and again, pictures of backsides. <laughs> yeah, a lot of Tasmanian tiger gone wild content. But they're, <laughs> they're, uh, the, the thing is their findings – have, are not considered proof of the persistence of the tiger at this point. Yet sightings continue. And you have to, if you look at it, if you're looking for like a comparison, you'll see that the phenomenon of these sightings has a lot in common with alleged sightings of a Sasquatch or Bigfoot. People seem to find what they think is scat. Uh, they might even say they've seen some hair. Uh, they see or hear live specimens. They discover footprints, right, just like in Bigfoot and so on. In July of 2019, Australian authorities in Tasmania got a report of a footprint spotted by an unnamed individual, someone who wanted to stay anonymous, while they were walking up to Sleeping Beauty Mountain in the southeast of the state. And so every time that people wanted to say, I guess they've given up the ghost, I guess the Tasmanian tiger is no more, someone else would come in with a sighting. And this inspired people to search further. To be clear, a lot of people conducting these searches, just like a lot of people who claim to have seen a tiger, they were not all just armchair enthusiasts. They were, in many cases, genuine scientists subject matter experts in their field. And there's another thing I think we should add. Australia is like North America in that it has a lot of remote or empty space, empty in terms of like there aren't a lot of people there. So if you are part of a Tasmanian tiger search team, you can target certain areas, right? You can kind of triangulate based on sightings and say, here is where we are most likely to see something if it's out there, but it's still kind of the old cliche of searching for a needle in a haystack. 
And that is where we want to introduce something I think is pretty exciting. Matt, we have to talk about the one and only, the man, the myth, the legend, Barry Brook. Barry Brook is a mammalian ecologist. He, he, he's an ecologist. He studies mammals. He's also a mammalian, uh, hopefully. Uh, he's, <laughs> he works with the University of Tasmania. And he's the co-creator of this thing called the Tasmanian Thylacine Sighting Records Database, or THSRD. Yeah, we love a good acronym. I love an acronym. You love an acronym? Yeah. That's right. So Barry and THSRD did something pretty impressive. Uh, he and the people that he works with analyzed a ton, a ton of sightings, or, you know, uh, sightings that were recorded, written down, whatever they saw, whatever uh, they captured, all of the reports, they analyzed it. It was 1,200 alleged sightings between 1910 and 2019, all of them taking place in Tasmania. And guess what? They found some surprising things. Oh, that they did, my friend. They did indeed. So no, before no, no. we get... Let's do, are, we gonna, are you poking holes already? <laughs> okay, 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 okay. No, no, you're right, you're right. Okay, so here's the thing. And there, there are a couple plot twists here. First... This paper, which is legit, uh, was released in January of 2021, and it caused a bit of a splash. You can read the preprint version online. We'll show you how to get there in a second. Uh, it builds a case that the thylacine did not die out the way that most scientists assume, the way that, in fact, most of the world assumes. There's an excerpt I wanted to pull that I thought was pretty interesting that lets you know where they're coming from. Quote, Contrary to expectations, the inferred extinction window, being of the Tasmanian tiger, is wide and relatively recent, spanning from the 1980s to the present day, with extinction most likely in the late 1990s or early 2000s. And Brooks himself said this was surprising. You want to unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, definitely, because... That's a big difference. A lot of time went past between 1936 and the 1990s or early 2000s. And basically what they're saying is that we know that the last captive thylacines died back then in the 1930s, right? Uh, but there was no way for humans to confirm if there were any thylacines living, you know, like hiding out. In, in the bush somewhere in the middle of Australia or somewhere in Tasmania. Um, just because we... We humans didn't look everywhere. We didn't. Uh, we didn't set up camera traps then, in uh, in the 1930s to see if they were all in fact gone, right? So we can't confirm fully that all thylacines went extinct in the 1930s. Yes. Yeah. And we'll also later this week discover why that's such a good point, and it is. Uh, mm -hmm. There. There's something else though. This is not the most exciting part. Matter of fact, Matt, I think this warrants a pause for a word from our sponsor. And then let's get to the juice. We've returned. This is, to me, the most exciting part of the paper. And, and Matt, I did the last excerpt, so I, I, I think the honor goes to you for this one. Sure. Quote, while improbable, these aggregate data and modeling suggest some chance of ongoing persistence in the remote wilderness of the island. We're talking about Tasmania here. Scratch! Record scratch! <laughs> yeah, they're saying that there could be thylacines still alive somewhere on the island. I know. This is at this point, I think I put this in notes, Q dumb and dumber, so you're saying there's a chance? <laughs> right? Uh, but references aside, there is nothing <sighs> dumb about this study. It is legit. The preprint version, I checked right before we recorded, is still available at biorxiv.org. They make a solid quantitative case for their conclusion from their analysis. Now, of course, this analysis is not conclusive. It's just uh, exciting stuff to point to, but it is legitimate science. Uh, you can also read a New York Times article and a couple other think pieces. They're just saying, stop trying to make thylacines happen. It's not going to happen. But what, what is fascinating about the research that Brooks and his team have done is that it means that unlike so many other alleged cryptid cases, there is a slim 
tantalizing, just possible chance that a relic population of Tasmanian tigers may be alive today. Yes, the odds against this are incredibly high. And yes, those odds dwindle with each passing year, but it's almost like um, it makes me think of a missing persons case. You know, people want the closure, right? Even if even if they know that closure will somehow be tragic. And I think there's uh, some collective guilt amidst the humans about this because evolution made the tiger very closely resemble man's best friend, the domesticated dog. And humans, I think, in a way, feel guilty about knowing that humanity was the assassin of this innocent animal. And so they want desperately for it to return. And this would usually be the end of our episode. This episode is going to be a little bit shorter uh, because we wanted to make these points and we wanted to save some cool stuff for later this week. But we have one more plot twist for you. Something that may upend the conspiracy cryptid cart, cryptid conspiracy cart, something that may upend the cart entirely. The crypto cart. The crypto cart. There it is. Yes. Thank you, man. Uh, The crypto caught entirely. More and more scientists are asking whether civilization has been thinking about these problems all wrong. Yeah, what if instead of searching for this animal that may well be extinct and it would just be for naught, you'd never find it. What if we, um, hmm, what if we do a little something with DNA and Jurassic Park these suckers? (laughs) mad science uh finds a way like we've said before good science fiction leads to science fact you know what i mean it's based on possible innovations and if you had told a young ben and matt back in 2005 or something like that that it was possible to bring an entire species back from the dead our response clearly would have been, I too love Jurassic Park. I like the whole franchise, (laughs) you know, I dig it. Dinosaurs are cool. But we would have been coming from a place of pop culture. And that is not necessarily the case any longer. But uh, Matt, I, you know, I wanted to find time to watch Jurassic Park again, at least the first one in preparation for this week's series. Uh, But I, I haven't yet. What's the... Okay, so what goes wrong? Just refresh me here. Um, from what I remember, what goes, what go- wrong? What goes wrong in Jurassic Park? Uh, I read, I read the the Crichton book. Um, and I think they still have the same problem in the film, which is that the the creatures resurrected by this company are meant to be sterile, incapable of reproducing. Right? Yes. And then, spoiler alert: three, two, one. Spoiler, of course. They do end up reproducing because of the way in which they were brought back, right? Yeah. The Oh, gosh. Hey, if you're listening and I'm wrong about this, please write to us because I think this is how it went down. The dinosaurs were brought back by the the little mosquito, right? Or mosquitoes. Right. They were in amber. There was some DNA or remnants of DNA left in there. And then they combined that with other animal DNA, amphibians, reptiles, uh, birds, I believe, a couple other things. So they they made a mixture of DNA and reconstructed the dinosaur based on bits of DNA that were remnant, basically, of dinosaurs in all those other species, uh, which is a cool concept. I love the idea. Mm-hmm. I, I just wonder if, my goodness, is that something that could, is that something that could really happen? And it's freaking me out what we found. We're going to be talking about next episode. Yeah, I believe you're right. It's a it's a combination of DNA from extant animals that were descended from these extinct animals. And there's a great fake uh, explainer commercial you can watch that occurs in the beginning of Jurassic Park. Full disclosure, folks, uh, Matt, Mission Control, and I just paused recording so we could watch it together. I don't think yeah. we have the rights to use it legally, but you can find it online. It's DNA. It's all the building block and blueprint of what makes you. 
<laughs> yes, That's yes, the pitch perfect. We don't need to use it now. You nailed it. So stay tuned, folks. Uh, we are diving deep this Friday into these bold new plans to bring entire species back from the grave. In the meantime, especially if you live in Tasmania, uh, if you live in Australia overall, uh, if you have visited or spent time in the area, we want to hear from you. What's your take? What do you reckon? Do you think there's any sand claims of living Tasmanian tigers? Have you yourself seen one? Or do you think you have? Do you know someone who has? Or do you think it's just the collective social guilt of uh, humans very clearly killing something that looked very much like man's best friend. Actually, I texted, um, <laughs> I know I got to wrap, but I texted you, Matt, earlier today on our group chat just to give a heads up that as dog lovers, this one would be a downer for us. I uh, di didn't feel great seeing that footage, not even counting that the poor guy's name was Benjamin. Didn't Didn't feel super... Super gassed about that one. Um, so is it maybe just collective guilt that makes humans want to say, we can bring this back? Let us know. We want to be easy to find online. Facebook, here's where it gets crazy. YouTube, conspiracy stuff. Instagram, conspiracy stuff show. Share your thoughts with uh, our fellow listeners. Uh, and if you're feeling froggy in the book front, uh, why not take a leap, go to stuffyoushouldreadbooks.com and uh, pre-order our book, which which came out. We're going to get fired if you don't pre-order it. Um, we may <laughs> have, like, be physically punished as well. So we are in distress tied to the trade tracks. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Pre-order the book. God, please. No, I, really, though, it's a it's a fantastic way to support the show. If you if you have the time to read and are interested and you've got the money to support our show, we really do appreciate it. If you make that choice, uh, it makes a great gift, by the way. It doesn't have to be anything special. It could just be a Tuesday. Like hey, Noel said, give it? it to your friends or your enemies. <laughs> so, That's right. <laughs> or both. And hey, if you don't use social media and you're not into reading at this very moment, but you like to talk, why not instead give us a call? Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. When you do call, please give yourself a cool nickname. Let us know if we can use your voice and message on the air. And then you've got three minutes in total to say whatever you want to say. We listen to everyone that comes in, though we are delayed sometimes, so it may take a week or two to hear it. But you might get a call back. Beware. Buyer beware. Caller beware. Sure. If for whatever reason you don't want to call, why not instead consider sending us an email? Those are fun. Those are easy. Hey, why don't you send one? We are conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.